proud supporters of Africa this week. Anjan, with us, you are number one. Welcome back to Africa This Week. This is the end of the Industrial Revolution as we know it, and in the new carbon neutral economy, the world's most advanced economies would rank at the bottom. In this carbon neutral world order, the emerging nations of the South possess all opportunity, innovation and creativity. These are the words of Jose Maria Figueres, former president of Costa Rica. He was visiting South Africa for a business dialogue conference. He spoke to Buntu Williams. Two wars that we need to fight and win. One is the war on poverty and today we have amassed sufficient economics to do that and sufficient technology to help us. And the other one is the war on climate change, which by far is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. Those two wars today can be won with the same instruments and the private sector and business are a key component of helping us achieve victory. The current approach to climate change appears overwhelmed by indecision and political dithering. Would you agree? I am often frustrated with how slow the governmental process of reaching an international agreement with respect to climate change moves. As you well know, we have the opportunity to further that dialogue in a couple of months when we, were all, when we will all be back here in South Africa for the meeting of COP17. And I hope that we will be able to further the agenda at COP17 here in South Africa. I hope we will be able to further international agreements with respect to technologies and sharing of technologies that can help us better cope with climate change. That we will be able to advance on how we are going to finance the transition towards a low carbon economy, that we will be able to advance the agenda with respect to reforestation. It's such an important issue, very pertinent for Africa, uh, that by the way is one of the continents that would suffer the most from climate change. But having said all of that and keeping my hopes high for the intergovernmental process to move forward, there is no time to wait for governments. On this one, business has to lead. We need to make the transition to a low carbon economy a viable business opportunity. And by a low carbon economy, what I want to say is that I very strongly believe that uh, perhaps we're coming to an end of 250,000 years of the Industrial Revolution when we thought that resources in the world were limitless, when we did not think of the repercussions of a global population that is going towards nine billion and that has the aspiration and every right to live in a much better way. The constraints put on developments towards the future by both a rising population on the one side and a planet with limits on the resources that we have oblige us to be much more efficient in the way we go about carving out better livelihoods for everybody in the planet into the future. That economy being much more efficient will also be an economy that emits a lot less carbon and therefore helps us combat climate change. The Lord Mayor of the City of London, Michael Bay, is visiting Africa to assess investment opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa's leading economies. He explained his mission. In my year, I'll travel to 23 countries um, wearing the banner of commercial diplomacy, which is our Prime Minister's uh, really strategy for improving uh, commercial opportunities for the United Kingdom. Now obviously we're dealing with a situation where the UK economy is struggling to retain growth having shrunk by 4% and to a large extent it's the banks that are blamed for the financial turmoil we've seen pre-recession, during the recession and today. How do you respond to that? Well financial services in Britain is still very important. We're about still 10% of our GDP uh, we contribute 124 billion uh, to the uh, economy of the United Kingdom per annum 
And I keep reminding our uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer that we uh, contribute 54 billion every year of taxes. So we are extremely important. Uh, and uh, really, it's in the interests of uh, the United Kingdom and the government to make sure that the city, in its broader sense, can operate and create jobs and prosperity for the whole nation. The big dilemma is that the banks account for less than 5% of GDP, and yet, collectively, the industry is blamed for 35% of the problems that unfolded during the credit crisis. So there's a lot of work that's needed in terms of restoring confidence. How are you going to address those? Well, I think the important thing is, uh, and, and I think uh, that the government realises, is that the city, and the city is more than just banks, banks, insurance, financial services generally, is part of the solution to creating jobs. Uh, we have to go forward looking forward. We can't go forward looking back. There were mistakes made in 2008 during the credit crisis, uh, but we've learned the lessons of those mistakes, and I think we are stronger for it. Uh, one of the great experiences in, in, in the world, and we've been going for many centuries, is to build our confidence and build our trade going forward. So I'm very confident that uh, we, we're in a very good place, uh, having come from a very challenging environment. Also in the context of, fi of uh, restoring confidence in financial services, are the current reports about investigations into libel, uh, infractions and maladministration on the currency side and the extent to which banks were complicit in manipulating rates to reduce borrowing costs. UK banks have been named alongside American banks. Whatever the outcome of these investigations, there's still a lot of work that's needed in terms of restoring confidence in the integrity of the British financial services sector. How are you going to address those issues in the work that you do? In fact, restoring confidence is very much part of my role. Uh, trust, confidence and the ethics of business. Uh, and that is, uh, I would say, probably my first priority. Because with confidence uh, comes better trade. But we have to make sure that happens across the whole G20 and the whole world. Uh, my word is my bond. That is what the city has been so famous for. Uh, uh, what we're not scared of is more regulation, re reformed regulation. And we found that uh, in 2008, regulation wasn't really man enough for the sophistication of many of the products, where the poachers were smarter than the gamekeepers. So we're restructuring our regulation, uh, and we are stronger for the experiences that we learnt in 2008. Now obviously as a result of the credit crisis and sluggish growth that we're seeing today, many investors looking for yield have started moving their investments into emerging markets, particularly Asia and some into Africa. Is that a problem for you? What we're interested in is in the size of the overall global pie. And as long as our share remains the same and the pie gets bigger, uh, then I think that's the most and the best that we can do. Uh, we have very strong, unique selling points in the City of London. Uh, we have, we're right in the middle of the time zone, and we're very attractive in terms of our, our contract law, our transparency, predictability. So we're very clear that uh, what we need to do to be competitive. But what we are finding is that the whole business model for doing business today is changing. Uh, cheap credit isn't coming from the East anymore that you alluded to. China is using that credit to stimulate consumption in their market. Uh, the Middle East is using their surpluses to diversify away from oil and to fund some of the issues for the Arab Spring. Japan, that used to fund a lot of surpluses, are using money to reconstruct uh, after their tsunami. And Germany is funding uh, some of the deficits that we're finding in southern Europe. So we're having to look at a different model and we're having to work a lot harder uh, to make sure that we attain the growth and realize the potential that we have in the city. And lastly, almost 417,000 hectares of land across Africa is certified organic agriculture, providing jobs for over 175,000 farmers. In South Africa alone, there are 50,000 hectares, and it seems the organic trend is filtering into all segments of our lives, including fashion. Ashley Evans reports. South Africa's fashion industry has long been morphing and advancing as new trends develop and carve the way for the next fashion footprint. But as consumers become ever aware of their own carbon footprint, the going green trend has made its mark on everything from the products we buy to the fashion we flaunt. 
At Luna, we've, we've tried to use natural and organic fabrics as, as often as possible. Our, our biggest challenge is actually sourcing the raw material, the fabric, um, to make up garments. Luna is quite a creative, natural brand, um, so it's like-minded people that, that actually have been with us a long time that are, are consistent customers. They're after something a little bit more um, niche that's not mainstream. It's a specialized uh, business that we have. While smaller boutiques can specialize in the niche market, larger retailers haven't found organic fashion to be as sustainable. In 2007, Woolworths spearheaded a pilot project in organic cotton farming. As a result, the following year, Woolworths was ranked the third largest consumer of organic cotton, behind giants such as Walmart and Nike. We've also piloted in South Africa a local organic cotton farm in the Limpopo province. And we're about three years into that program, but we, we're battling to really grow that market again because of the premium involved in organic cotton. So we are looking at other um, cotton programs like Better Cotton as a solution for us from our international sourcing perspective going forward. While the organic cotton farming industry is growing and is environmentally sustainable, it is not yet considered economically viable. The high premiums associated with organic cotton farming have caused many funders to pull out. Fashionistas are just not willing to pay the extra green for going green. From a consumer trend perspective, I think more and more consumers are interested in knowing where product was manufactured, that it was manufactured in an ethical and responsible way. But at the same time, they don't want to pay more money for that necessarily. And it's trying to balance those two issues in a, a way that makes good business sense. It is a great expense. I think if you think about it, if you bought you know, organic t-shirt compared to a regular cotton t-shirt, you do pay a premium. Um, I think especially now in the recession, the consumer is sort of hesitant to spend that extra bit on organic clothing, even though it's doing something good for the planet, they'd rather do something good for their pockets. Retailers and consumers are, however, becoming creative in finding affordable ways to be environmentally friendly when it comes to clothes. We do manage to turn waste fabric, which are offcuts from, from our production, into things like paper. Consumers are tending to look at their own wardrobes and maybe upcycle their existing garments, get together with friends, hold a swishing party, which is where you exchange your clothes. People are looking at you know, fair trade as well as a big thing. In reality, the majority of impacts from an environmental perspective, particularly on energy and water use, are actually once a product's left our store and the way that the customer uses it for washing, cleaning, drying, all of those issues. So a key part of our focus and innovation going forward is to make sure we can give products to customers that are able to be washed at 30 degrees, help save energy and water, don't have to be dry cleaned or ironed, and that way we can actually save the energy and water usage in the life of the product going forward. While well, only a handful of designers are able to make a sustainable business out of sustainable fashion, others are already thinking about responsible creativity for the future. It seems that eco-couture could be more than just a passing trend.